Hello and welcome to uh, the uh, level five of, of step one of the Colorado Space Grant Consortium's uh, online version of our, our uh, robotics challenge. This we've titled this one "Advanced Driving," uh, and this 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 is in in this case there's no we're not adding uh, any capabilities or anything. It, this is really about starting to work with the robot. Uh, both in terms of code and and a bit physically, uh, just to to try to get a feel about how our robots are actually driving and how we would adjust the driving of the robot and 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 so on. All right. So, in uh, this uh, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, suggested ways to structure your code to make your life a little bit easier um, and, and and allow things to go more quickly, and which includes how to write simple functions uh, that that allow us to uh, sort of create blocks of code that do repeated tasks over and over, and we only have to create the block of code once. Uh, talk a little bit about physical physical adjustments to the chassis of the robot. How, things you might do to characterize the performance of your robot are useful. Th you know, there are useful things for you to know um, about your robot in terms of, of of how long it takes to drive a certain distance or things like that. And then finally describing uh, sort of a, a, a driving test we can do with our robot to to kind of to help us focus what we're doing and and uh, tune our robot a little bit uh, so we can get more or less uh, consistent performance out of the robot okay so the first quest first thing I wanted to talk a bit about was uh, uh, things you can do in your code to make your life easier and avoid uh, Problems uh, like a you know a, a, a line of code that's correct but doesn't do what you want, um, you know. So so ha, ha, you know, reduced error tracking time and, and code updating time. Right? The first was something we've done already and you've seen it. Uh, so but just just as worthwhile pointing out, I think is um, if there are parameters or, or values that we want to set in the code that get used in a lot of different places. Uh, one of the things you've we, you've seen already in our some of our example code. Um, and if you look in the advanced driving uh, example code uh, that that we, we make available on the website uh, that we're going to use a little bit later in this uh, uh, video, is that I set a number of parameters um, in the in the declaration part. That is before we even get into void uh, setup, right? And the idea is that way, if these parameters change or need to be adjusted, which they do, a lot of them. Um, they're set up top. I can use them over and over. And if I need to change them, I make a change in one spot, and and then every other place I use them in the code, I've 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 used a variable name to do that. So I only have to make a change once at the beginning, and everything is good. So that's the first thing I suggest is figure out the kinds of things, or if you see things that you're using a lot, set those as parameters at the beginning, and then um, you can just call the parameter when you need it. You don't have to remember that pin the pin. Uh, for uh, the pulse width modulation of B is 11 or something. You've, you've set that up in the code early on. Um, the second thing um, is, is how to create uh, code functions or functions in your code that do tasks that need to be repeated. Uh, so for example, this, here's this little snippet of code I have down here is a, a, fu a function I've created that I call forward. And the idea is that that, that function is how I'm going to drive my robot forward instead of uh, doing multiple lines of code every time I need to drive the right forward, the robot forward. I just call this function and tell it I want to go forward, um, how fast and how long, and um, that that gives me easy control of the robot. But I only had to write the, the block of code once. If you want to know more about uh, creating functions, we'll talk. I, I'll give a little bit of a tutorial here later on in the video about some simple ways of setting up functions and how they work. But um, there's also this online reference, for example, and you can find lots of others. Um, at the, um, but at the, this is the Arduino reference for doing functions. I've, I've put in a link to, to, to putting the Arduino function, how Arduino handles functions, and there, there are notes on that. Um, OK, so um, I want to take a look at a couple pieces of example code that we've given you. The first is. Uh, shows how some examples of, of, sh of doing functions um, um, and I call that function underscore examples and we'll take a look at that in a minute 
And then there's the advanced driving code that we'd referenced already where I, I kind of block out some functions and some basic driving maneuvers that we can then use to, to program more complicated driving maneuvers. So let's take a look at uh, a sk sketch we're calling function examples, right? And it should be included in the example code you were able to download. Uh, and and this, this is a very simple sketch. Uh, it really doesn't do anything in terms of driving a robot. It's, it's designed to just to show how to create a couple different types of functions and different things that functions can do. Um, so... Um, it's, right, so the idea is it, it'll show you, it demonstrates two different types of functions. There's a void function, and we've seen void functions already, things like void loop or uh, void setup in, in, in code, um, and an int function, right, a function that's to type, created as a type integer. Um, uh, it shows how to pass parameters to functions, with, so we do that with one of the functions in here shows how to use global variables inside a function, and we'll, lo we'll look at that as well. Um, okay, so, so w what, is, what does this code do, right? Well, I'm gonna, I, I wanna look a little bit at the top of the code, then we'll go look at the functions, and we'll come back and look at the actual execution of the code in void loop. All right, so uh, in the main code itself, I define three variables, right? Just three integer variables, I call them very cleverly, i, j, and k. Right, and the idea is we're just going to use these to calculate, uh, hold values and calculate with, um, as a demonstration of different different uh, functions and what they can do. So, um, right, so the, the the way you normally place functions uh, in a sketch, if you're just going to create your own functions, is you put them after the end of void loop. So if we scroll down, and we'll scroll back up and look at the stuff in more detail after we've looked at the functions. If you scroll down to the bottom of void loop, right, there's on line 41 is the, the, the curly brace that closes void loop, and that normally would end our, our sketch. But what you see now is that there are two functions uh, created or, or defined below. So there's some extra code, and this defines those functions, right? So the first function I called return sum, right? And it's of a type integer. Um, and so the idea is it takes two arguments, right? And we're looking at line 43 here. Um, uh, it takes an argument that I, I've called the num1, an integer argument, and then a second integer argument that I'm calling num2. And what uh, return sum does is very simple. It just takes num1 and adds it to num2 and returns that as a value, right? So, um, right, so down here in the code, um, um, I, I actually create an internal variable Inside this function, I call it sum, and that's what I'm going to use to hold the sum of num1 and num2. You don't have to do it this way, but I just wanted to show that you can create variables inside your function. And one thing to realize is that what we'll see later is variables that are created further up in the, in the code, right at the beginning of the code, are available inside my functions, but variables I create inside my functions are not, not available anywhere ex except in the function where they've been created. So the idea is I, I create an integer variable, I call it sum, on line 50, I just add num1 in, to num2, and I assign that value to sum. And then uh, in order to, because I've declared this as a type integer function, it needs to re return an integer value. And so there's a, there's a um, command called return. And, the, and what you do is, is you, you say, I, now I want to return for this function the value that I've put in sum. Right, so very straightforward, just takes the two numbers, adds them together, and then returns them to the function. And we'll look at how you use that function in the main code in a, in a minute. Um, the second uh, function I created is of type void, is on line 54, I call it print product. And notice it doesn't take any arguments. Um, notice you still have to have the parentheses there, even if the, the function takes no arguments, you just give it a, uh, a, a set of parentheses with nothing inside. So what does print product do? Well, print product uses global variables. So print product knows, I know that there's a, a variable i's, j, and k, and that they're all global in scope, so I can use them inside print product. So instead of passing those as parameters, I just grab them, right? Um, and so I take i times j, and I, ins and I assign that to k. And then from inside the function itself, 
I do the printing, right? So I, I, I print out that I times J equals K. Pretty simple. Okay, so let's now look in the main code and see uh, what it is that um, the, the, the code does. How does it call these functions and then what do the functions do? And then we'll, we'll, we'll compile and run this. Um, okay, so I set up my serial communication in void setup. That's all that's there, um, right? Then in void loop, I, I, um, I call the functions and do different things, right? So um, on line 24, uh, I call that return sum function. And remember, it's of type integer. I pass it the two values I've created already, i and j, as its two arguments. And then I assign uh, those values to k, right? So k gets return the return sum of i and j. Um, and then I just have some prints similar to what I had in that, that other function down, uh, the print product function, where I print that uh, i plus j uh, equals k, all right? Um, then um, I go down and I call uh, the print product function, right? And remember, the print product function doesn't take any arguments. It doesn't return a value because it's of type void. And I do all the actual printing out stuff um, inside that function, right? And we've already looked at that code. Um, then I just do some extra printing to look at what the current value is k to show that in fact inside when print pro when the value of k is changed inside print product, the value of k has been changed globally. Um, and then just for fun, um, I'm in I'm in void loop. I increment uh, i and j. That is, I increase both i and j by one. And there's different ways you can do that, but one easy way in C or C plus plus is to do i plus plus or j plus plus. What this tells it, what this command says is take the variable, the integer variable, whatever it is, i or j, and just add one to it. Right. So this funny syntax. That's what it does. Okay. So let's go ahead and compile the code and um, make sure it compiles. Okay, so it compiles. Um, and then I'm going to upload the code. Actually, I'm gonna open my serial monitor first um, so I can look at what's in there, um, right? Oh, it's already running in there. So I'm gonna uh, uh, start over. So it, um, I'm going to compile and upload. Okay, um, and I, oh, I'm outside of the, the window we're shooting here, so let me move this down. And I'm gonna shut off auto-scroll. Okay, so the, 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 the code is just running and we can look at what it's outputting, um, right? So by the time I stopped it here, for example, um, I've called the function return sum and it turns out i is now 46 and j is 47. So 46 plus 47 equals 93. Um, and then the next thing that happens is it calls the uh, function print product um, and it multiplies six, 46 times 47. And, and so it turns out 46 times 47 is 2,162 and so on. And then notice um, when we return into the, the, the main code, I just print the value of k and because I've assigned it inside print product, the value of K is now 2162. All right, I, also, I wanted to take a quick look at uh, the, the advanced driving code. This, this code basically sets up uh, some driving functions and sets up some parameters and so on. And the, uh, the idea is uh, it's 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 a good starting place um, to 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 do your code your own driving right and and uh, so let's just take a a quick look here at what what's in the code um, like uh, we've we talked about previously I define a number of parameters that um, I. I want to have available to me and you use in the code later. Uh, you can add more, and in fact, in my version where I actually start programming my ro robot to try to do a little more complicated driving, I actually do add more for myself. So, um, you know, that's that's a. It, it depends on what you feel like doing and, and so on. But I suggest uh, setting up a number of these parameters. So uh, things we've seen before: the setting up the pulse with with pins here from like from lines nine to seventeen. Um, uh, in 21 and 22, I set uh, default um, 
powers or, or settings, pulse width uh, values for the motors. Uh, the idea here is um, uh, one of the things I like to do with, is characterize my robot. Um, is does it drive straight? Uh, generally, these chassis don't drive exactly straight if you give them the same power to both motors. Um, and so one of the things uh, I did in characterization is try to adjust the relative pulse width um, values for my motors so that the robot would actually drive straight. And so I've, I've just set them to the maximum value as defaults in the, this code, but probably what you're going to want to do is do a little testing and see which side meet motors you want to drive a little slower um, and, and, and slow those down to try to get, get a little more, get the driving to be a little straighter. Um, I set a couple param parameters. Um, um, one is, is a default. If, if nothing else, I just, I'm going to drive for four seconds or 4,000 milliseconds. Um, another characterization, uh, that we can talk about a little yeah. later is, uh, setting, figuring out how long it takes your robot to turn 90 degrees, right? So if you run the motors, you know, for how long. So, um, and this is based on a very preliminary value for my robot. It turns out about 1.3 seconds, turns it roughly 90 degrees, although, you know, we'll, I'll talk more about that as well. Um, okay, so then in void setup, we set up our pins, and this is, is new stuff. I put in a longer de uh, delay, um, and no notice that's we've done that before, so, so 10 seconds. Uh, and actually, one of the things I didn't do in this code, but I have in my later codes, is I actually have made that a parameter as well. So if I want to make the delay longer, um, I, I've just got a, I call it a time long or something like that, and I, I set this value and then give that as an argument to delay. Okay. Um, so eventually what we're going to do in void loop is put the main driving code, so the instructions for what we want the robot to do. And, um, you know, here it's a very simple example. It doesn't really do much exciting. You know, I drive forward, I drive backwards, I rotate to the right, I rotate to the, to the left, and in between I have stop. So what are all these things I'm calling here? Well, these are all functions that I've defined to help me drive the robot. And notice I called them multiple times, so it's it's kind of it's an efficient thing to have have driven, written functions to do them. So if we scroll down further, here's my void forward function, uh, right? It doesn't reach it's void, so it doesn't return any values. Um, I I pass it three parameters. Um, how long do I want that drive forward maneuver to take? And I just call that um, duration, um, and then I pass it the pulse widths for my two motors, so I control it. I can independently control the two motor speeds. So. If I want to go straight, typically I might just in, put in my values for um, back up here for uh, the, the straight for, for A and B that I think make it go straight. But notice that also means that I could use the forward um, um, the, the forward function to, to, to drive forward but try to curve one direction or the other by adjusting those pulse width values. Um, a very similar function for reverse, it takes the same arguments, works in a similar way. Um, I, I like to have a function that allows me to stop, and I really only need to know how long, because I am uh, i don't need to pass it powers because I shut both motors off, basically, if I'm going to stop. Um, so I have a stop function that I can use to do, you know, little pauses or long pauses as part of my programming. And then I chose, you could do this differently, but I chose to do a rotate right and a rotate left function. So here's my rotate right function where it um, runs the motors in opposite directions to rotate to the right and there's a similar function that does it rotates it to the left. Um, so anyway, there's, there's, there's those functions I set up. Notice there's a lot of different ways that you could do this and you might actually find that the way I've set up my functions you don't really like or you, you think could be done better. Um, and so one thing I suggest is uh, you don't have to, but if, if you should certainly, certainly feel free uh, to define your own functions to do different things or even redefine my functions um, so that they work in a way that you think is, 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 is better suited to what you want them to do. Um, again, I, just, I, cho I chose very straightforward uh, ways of doing this um, and, and coded those functions to do kind of do the, the straightforward things. So I wanted to just say a bit about um, some some other uh, things you might do in your coding to make your life easier and help you uh, 
get a working code faster and avoid a lot of frustration. So uh, one of the things we suggest uh, is uh, think big picture, when, right? Because when we get to coding for the robots uh, where they need to do more complicated things, uh, they the, the 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 code in 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 uh, the main code, say in void loop, can get quite complicated potentially. Um, and so figuring out just how to write that complicated code and then you know, making sure that it's correct can actually get kind of challenging. So the first thing we suggest is think big picture, right? That is, you, you can define functions to do repeated tasks. We can set parameters ahead of time. But if we have a kind of complicated set of things we want the robot to do before you actually write lines of code, um, make an outline in some form or the other. Um, and I'll give examples of how I did this for my driving test a little later on in the video um, that, that that kind of lay out what you want to do and then go back in and fill in the code that does that um, right because if you start right if you if you if you jump in and start writing code you might get it right but often you'll get confused or you'll you'll mess something up and you're not you know in, in the thing is you'll create code that you can compile but it just doesn't do what you want so having that really logical structure in your mind so you know what it's supposed to do and then produced in code will help you a lot. Um, and and, and you know, for me, it, it, it reduces the level of frustration uh, uh, a lot and it makes, it makes my coding faster and more efficient because I make less mistakes. Um, okay, so um, uh, another thing that's very useful is to, is to have debug statements. Um, in the early history of programming, um, the machines that people were programming weren't uh, fully electronic. That is, they had a lot of physical parts that were actually part of, of what the machine was doing. Um, and so the, the term debugging actually referred to the, in those early machines where there were mechanical relays and switches, uh, sometimes actual bugs would get in there and cause short circuits or, or problems. Uh, um, uh, so in fact, on the, on the right, you can actually see here, this is a page from... Uh, uh, a notebook by a woman named Grace Hopper, uh, who was an early programmer, and then later went on to be an admiral in the Navy and work on the no uh, nu nuclear programs there. Uh, she is the actual uh, credited with is the person who who came up with the, the term debugging, right? Because uh, you can see there they actually found a moth. <laughs> they, they, things weren't working, and they, they they wondered what was going on, and actually they had to go physically in and discover. Yep, there was there was an actual bug inside. Um, so what do debug statements look like? Uh, they can take a lot of different forms. The most common way I use them is, you know, because I, I want to know a couple things. Where am I in the code when I see, I, I see the robot doing something that I don't expect or I don't think it should do? I want to know where I am in the code. Where is that problem happening? Um, and so I just a printout of I'm here in the code um, or something that indicates to me where I am in the code. And then the other thing is I usually want to know, okay, what is the robot thinking? Uh, which usually means I want to know what variables are set, you know, that it's using to, to make decisions or, or, or operate things. So as a, you know, as a simple example, um, we have a number of these and you can add more, um, you know, as you need them. And I urge you to add more as you need them for your coding. But like down in um, uh, the forward function, right, there's a, if you look in there, there's some serial prints um, where we print out to the serial monitor and the idea is it says I'm moving forward, so it tells me I'm in the forward uh, thing, and then, it and then it prints out, uh, in this case, the value of, of the duration, how long I thought, thought I should move forward. And notice I could add code there. I could add, okay, what are, what what are my uh, pin, you know, what are my pulse width values set at, things like that. So anyway, um, the idea is if if you're if you're if your robot's doing something you don't expect, one of the things I suggest is going and start putting in debug statements and hooking up to the serial monitor and just looking at what is the code actually doing, right? Uh, you know, what did you actually code as opposed to what you thought you might have coded? Because sometimes what we think we code isn't what we actually coded. Um, and that will help you find those things where maybe a parameter got set wrong or something like that. Okay, um, so far we've been talking all about code, but one of the things, especially with, I think with any robot, but especially with these inexpensive chassis that we're using um, is you know, it's a $30 chassis, right? So maybe expecting too much um, in terms of high la level of function is something we shouldn't do. Um, but, you know, they're snapped together. They've got little screws that tighten in and so on. 
Um, and so one of the things that um, is worth thinking about and looking at is how does your chassis actually function, right? And that you can start doing it with the advanced driving code and write other code to have it drive in different ways and just see what it does. And one of the things I discovered, for example, um, I had been working with the chassis for a while, preparing for doing this advanced driving stuff. And I, it was things were working pretty well, actually. And I noticed that one of the wheels or one of the motor uh, that screws onto the side was a little loose. That is, the screws were loose. And I, did, I didn't want it to fall off or anything. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be good. I'm going to tighten up those screws. So I did. Uh, and then what I found is that the way the robot was driving changed significantly. And in fact, it, drive, it, it drove less well um, with all the, the, the things tightened up. So one of the things I've been doing a little bit of is adjusting uh, some of those connections where I've loosening them up. And I've, I've been thinking about other things. I haven't had time, but, you know, um, adjusting other things on the robot, maybe adding like a more, a more grippy surface to the wheels or something like that. But, but one of the things that we don't want to neglect here is looking at physically how does the robot drive and can we adjust that and get more consistent driving um, by, by adjusting the um, physical, physical things on the robot. Right. And the one, as I mentioned already, the one thing I discovered is if I have all my wheel mounts really tightly screwed on, it turns out my robot uh, doesn't drive as well. And I think it's it's basically a really, you know, a poor person's uh, suspension system is that if those those wheels can flex around a little bit, it actually makes it a little more uh, robust in terms of driving on different surfaces where the surface changes a little or something like that. OK. Um, and, and the final thing I suggest, um, and this is this has been really useful for me um, in in coding more complicated driving, is is do things that help allow me to characterize the robot's performance. Um, so for what I mean by that, well, we already talked about trying to figure out pulse width values for the right side and left side wheels that make the robot drive straight. For for example, mine. If I, I drive both at full power, it curves off, uh, I think, to the right. But it, you know, it curves off a little bit. And so I needed to figure out how to drive, drive the motors at different levels that cause the robot to drive straighter. Um, and, and, and if you think about other things we want to do with the robot, especially in this challenge, um, it's going to turn a lot. So uh, And I, I've, I haven't tried to do curvy turns yet. I think those are trickier. So what I do when I want to turn is I just try to ro rotate the robot. And usually I want to rotate 90 degrees, although I might want different things. But, but it's, what is useful to know, for example, is how long does it take the robot to turn right or left 90 degrees? Um, you know, ideally, you'd think it's the same thing. I think it's probably not quite the same for my robot, and I haven't gone and characterized that. But at least I have made, I've made a few measurements to try to figure out how long it takes to do that. Um, and I can use that as a parameter in my programming. Um, another really useful one is, is, is if I want to drive um, a course, which is our advanced driving test, uh, I want to know how, f if I drive the, m the motors for a certain amount of time at, say, full power, how far would the ro robot typically drive, right? So I know if, like, oh, I've got to drive three feet, how long do I have to drive the motors to go about three feet? And so the way I did that is I had the robot drive um, for a fixed amount of time, actually, and then I, 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 I um, uh, marked out where it started and where it ended after that time. And I was able to measure it and figure out the time for the robot to drive, say, one foot. And then I could use that as a, as a, as a, a parameter. So if I wanted to go three feet, I just would take that time and multiply it by three, for example. All right, let's talk a little bit about what the, uh, the success criteria, the driving test we, we want you to do uh, to, for, for the advanced driving portion here. Um, and I'll show you an example of the, the, what I set up as my test here in a few minutes. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the minimum we want your robot to try to do is uh, the following. In a single drive, right, so programming a single drive for your robot, uh, have, it drive a, ha have some sort of obstacle for it to drive around and drive around at least one obstacle. You can have more. Um, have a second obstacle so you can try to thread the needle, if you will, drive between two obstacles, and then try to have it return at least approximately to its starting position. So 
This is a little my little sketch of what I set up for my driving test. Um, and I made it a little more complicated than it needs to be, so you might learn from me and, and simplify it a little bit. Um, right, so I just, I, I, I set up um, two obstacles, and I'll show you a photograph of what I set up. Basically, I used just some empty cardboard boxes to set up an obstacle, um, some optical, obstacles in my, in my kitchen, actually. Um, and so the idea is, um, then I mapped out what, how I wanted the robot to drive. So the, dro the robot here at the, starts here at the, at the bottom, in this diagram, uh, starts by making a right turn, driving a bit, left turn, drive between the left turn again, be drive between the opticals, right turn, up, and so on. Okay, and in terms of coding this, um, uh, notice there's in essence a number of um, maneuvers here. There's the there's turn maneuvers, there's dri and driving forward, um, and so uh, what I did then is I basically broke the drive up into a number of uh, steps or um, uh, maneuvers. And you can actually see here, if you look carefully, like I, I've numbered in, I think, red, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, and that was just to help me keep track as I was coding where I was in the, you know, on, on this little, little path. So I, I could, I could code it out uh, and not get too confused because it turns out, you know, having 50 or 60 lines of right, left, straight, you know, is, is, can be a little bit confusing. Um, so then what I did is I made myself a list of what those maneuvers were going to be. Um, right. So you can see here, um, you know, started by with a, a night, a right turn of 90 degrees, then driving forward, then a left turn of 90 degrees forward, left 90, um, 90, uh, forward and so on. And then w the other thing I decided to add, which I didn't put on the list, but is between each um, maneuver, I had the pa robot pause for just about a second. Uh, so it wasn't going from one maneuver to the other right away. Um, so, um, it will, and what is, what does that coding look like? Well, there, uh, in the code, I could, I could then set up the code for each leg. And so this is a snippet of my larger piece of code that I wrote to, to, to drive with, um, right. So the first leg was a right turn, um, a short stop, then driving forward, then a short stop, then the leg two. I on my diagram was I rotated left and drove and so on. And you can, you know, if you look at this code, you can see I did a couple of things. Um, I'd, I'd set up some parameters like the time to drive one foot, the time to rotate approximately ninety degrees. And then as I started adjusting the code, I discovered, um, for example, my rotates rights and lefts weren't, didn't take exactly the same amount of time. So I needed to spend a little more time rotate uh, to get the robot to rotate to the left. Um, so I put a multiplier in there um, and I had different distances I needed to drive. So I, I put multipliers in, um, you know, so I, you know, I just kind of eyeballed it and said, oh, I need to go about two feet. So that's two times the time to go one foot and so on. So anyway, there's a snippet of my code um, just showing how I laid things out and broke it up into legs. Um, so, and here's a photograph of my, my layout in my kitchen on the floor. Uh, you can see there's just a couple empty, um, boxes there that define my obstacles and my robots there approximately in its starting position. And actually you'll see on the video at, uh, when I show the video of, of my driving, um, that I actually did it without the obstacles in place. And you can actually kind of see, if you look carefully. I've got a little bit of that blue painter's tape that I've used to outline my obstacles. So that way I could pull up the obstacles, have it drive if I needed to, you know, say cook dinner or something. I could pull, the, I didn't have to leave the boxes in there while I was testing. I'd, I'd set up my course and was able to lay it out. Now, um, the caution I would give you um, is uh, I own my own house and I used the painter tape, which is easy to pull up. So I knew I wasn't marring the floor. If you don't own your own, the, the, if you don't own the place you live, um, if you rent or you live with your parents or whatever, uh, just pe please be somewhat careful about how you you lay out your course and and what you do to market. You know, please don't do any something do, any, do anything that would uh, permanently damage something where you're not going to get your deposit back or your parents are going to be really angry with you or whatever. Um, so, but anyway, there's there's my basic course with the robot ready to start driving now. Um, 
one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is what does success look like here? Because I, I thought of, of this challenge and I started to code it and, and tried to do it for myself. And what I discovered is I could get the robot to approximately do it, um, and that didn't take me too long, but that it was starting to take me a long time to make very subtle tweaks to the coding, um, first of all. And second of all, the robot, there was, only a, there was a level of repeatability that I could get to, but no further. That is, if I would set the robot up and run it multiple times, it wouldn't take exactly the path, same path each time. You know, I think just due to uh, slightly different uh, levels of friction and, and so on as it operated. Um, so one of the things that I want you to realize, the goal here is not necessarily to get you to robot to drive perfectly. And, and especially if you started investing uh, a fair amount of time and it's not driving perfectly, don't feel like, oh, I can't pass the level because um, my robot's, you know, it's driving, but it's not, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble getting it do, to do the exact maneuver I've set up for it to do. That's not the goal here. Um, what, we want, what we do want to do is spend some time, like we've already talked about, um, is characterizing the driving and making sure that the, the robot is at least driving okay so that for future use, future use we can use it as a platform. Um, my uh, very strong advice and my expectation to you and my expectation of you is once you've got the robot running the advanced driving code or your version of the advanced driving code and you start working with it, you know, if you spend a couple hours, maybe two hours or so, working with it. Um, and if, it, if you can do it, if you can get it all adjusted faster, great. But if you hit that two hour mark and it's driving okay, um, and you can judge when you watch my video of my robot driving, what I assume I, I chose to be okay and stop. Um, working. Don't think, oh, I got to keep tweaking it and tweaking it and tweaking and spend 10, 12, 15, you know, a really long time getting a very perfect drive out of it because that's not the goal. Like if you want to do that, great, you know, have fun, um, you know, tweaking the robot to the nth degree. Um, but but our, my expectations is, you know, once you've hit about that two hour mark, if it's still not driving exactly like you want it, shoot your video, upload it and, and advance to the next level, will advance you to the next level. It's, the idea is not uh, to spend a really long time getting a very perfect drive on, on the, with the robot at this state. Um, okay, so what do you need to do to the advance, advance to the next level? Um, uh, post a video of your, your robot um, completing its driving test to your portfolio and to the end, and then of course a link to the discard channel so we can all look at it. Um, you know, and again, this is completing the driving test is driving to the okay level, not driving super duper great um, or, you know, driving perfectly. That's not the point. Um, the other thing to do is post a note to your portfolio about any adjustments you made to the robot's chassis to improve its performance. Um, and, you know, a little bit about the characterization of performance. So, it, you know, it, take, it took about 1.7 seconds for my robot to, to execute a 90 degree right turn. It, it was, you know, it took my robot um, 1.2 seconds to drive one foot, whatever, right? So just a little bit about that, those characterizations you did. Um, um, you know, add that to your portfolio because that's kind of the part where you're really getting in there and testing and adjusting and seeing how the robot functions. All right, so you can see from my video that my robot was driving okay. Um, you know, if I'd had the obstacles in place, it would have hit in a place or two. All the, the turns weren't exactly 90 degrees, um, in a, you know, and it was di slightly different in different spots, even though I would turn 
the robot for exactly the same amount of time. Um, and the distances, again, probably could use some tweaking. But the point is I'd, I'd spent, um, you know, an hour or two working with it. And um, that was sort of the level I could get to. So it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't, you know, it definitely wasn't perfect. So anyway, use, use that as a kind of a guideline for yourself of, of what you should be looking for um, um, in terms of getting the robot to drive. It's executing basically the maneuvers that we need it to execute. And you know maybe if we spent a really long time, I could have tweaked it and got it. But I had a life to get on with, so I stopped where I did. So that, and that's what I'd like you to do as well, OK?